We're about to move on to our second panel, which is about um, health care reform and health insurance and musicians. And um, we'll have our panelists up here for a minute, um, but first I'm going to have Renata Marano from, the, um, from AHERC up to just talk about the health care reform legislation that passed in March, specifically the timeline that's associated with some of the reforms that are in place in it and how it impacts different sectors of uh, the, the public, whether you're insured right now, whether you're on a group plan, whether you're uninsured. Um, and then the conversation will, you know, will talk about how it impacts musicians in particular. Um, Future Music Coalition did a survey actually back in March of this year where we were trying to gauge the level of health care uh, health insurance among musicians. We did a survey back in 2002, and at that time, about 2,700 artists responded to the survey. And at that point, 44% said they weren't insured, which is a really high number. Um, but that was 2002, and so we thought we would ask the same questions again this spring. And 1,450 musicians responded to this survey, and 33% said they were not insured. This is still about twice the national average. Um, Kaiser Family Foundation um, uh, says that uh, about 17% of the American public is currently uninsured. So we had other questions on the survey that tried to figure out what kind of musicians are uninsured and why. Um, some interesting little tidbits I'll just throw out because I think we can get to them in the conversation later. Um, one of them is that um, the more time an artist spends doing their craft, say artists that said they're spending 50% of their time and earning 50% of their income uh, from music, they're more likely to be uninsured than just your average musician. Um, that number was 38% said they were uninsured. And then the folks who were spending all of their time and making all of their money being a musician, that was I think 36% said they were uninsured. The number in the middle kind of suggests that those are the artists that are bridging, straddling two worlds. They're trying to create a career as a musician, but they're also probably working half-time some other job. But we all know, probably, being employed, <laughs> some, of us, some of us employed by our, uh, ourselves, that access to benefits from an employer, which is largely how most of us get insurance, usually you have to work you know, full-time full hours to get there. So. We have a sense that the folks who are straddling in the middle are having the hardest time getting it because they just don't have access to the benefits that most employers provide. Another really interesting one, and I'll stop after this, is that there was, uh, we asked um, respondents about whether they were a member of any particular musician organizations, and for that we had everything from the American performance rights organizations like ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, also um, the unions, AFM, AFTRA, and AGMA. And many of the organizations that represent certain genres of music, like the Folk Alliance or the Americana Music Association, and we found that membership actually matters. That the folks who were <coughs> said they were members of any organization were more likely to be insured than people who weren't. Um, in some cases, the member organizations do have um, provide members with access to group plans, and we can talk about some of those resources today. Um, but sometimes it just we think there were places where there were respondents who say were members of organizations that didn't have a group plan, but it just made a sense that, made us, it made us think that, um, that it implied that they were thinking of their music as a career, and so they were um, sort of formalizing all of the structures. They were becoming a member and perhaps figuring out their health insurance on their own because they recognized that this was something they were committing to. Um, cost is clearly a factor. It was 86 percent of the um, people who said who were uninsured said that cost was the primary factor, the reason they didn't have health insurance. But what we'll talk about today is with um, our work with our HINT program is sometimes cost masks just like a lack of understanding of what the affordable options might be. And so perhaps the number cost also includes people who just aren't sure of all the different options they could um, be approaching, whether it's state funded plans or group plans or individual plans that maybe incorporating as a small business. So we'll talk with Alex about some of those too and Adam Hutler. So um, I just want to turn the stage over to, to uh, Renata so she can give us a little bit of background about the current healthcare legislation and how it's affecting everybody as the timeline on different, um, different things rolls out. Renata. Thank you very much. Um, my name's Renata, and I'm a social worker. I work for the Actors Fund. Can you hear me? Am I speaking into the mic? All right, there. 
Um, I work for the Actors Fund, uh, and uh, I work in a, a for a program called the Artist Health Insurance Resource Center that I'll talk a little bit later about. Um, the Actors Fund, just so you all know, is for everyone in entertainment, including musicians. So uh, it's for dancers, singers, actors, ushers, stagehands, and we have four different areas of service. We have social services, which helps people uh, who are in times of crisis. Maybe they can't pay their rent or uh, they can't pay their insurance premium. Sometimes we have financial assistance. We have housing for people in the entertainment industry in New York and LA. We help train people to do sideline jobs, and we also have health care services. We have a free clinic in New York City and a part-time free clinic in LA. Um, I, like I said, I'm a social worker and I have worked in the healthcare industry and I have seen how it works and how it doesn't work. And my goal is to make you all educated consumers because healthcare is an industry in this country. It is for profit. Um, I want to address how reform, how the healthcare reform will affect the music industry, what you can do now, and what's going to be available to you in 2014. This is a one hour presentation that I'm going to try and do in 15 minutes, so bear with me. Um, this presentation is directed with an eye towards how reform affects consumers directly. There are a lot of other things in this bill, including money for research, for workforce development, that I'm not going to focus on. I'm just going to focus on how it's going to affect musicians, uh, small business owners, freelancers, etc. And I have a disclaimer, which is that parts of this law are still ambiguous and still being written. So we are waiting to see how the details will be implemented and formulated. So I may not be able to answer all of your questions, but I will do my very best. All right? OK. Um, so a couple, one thing we'll roll, one very important thing we'll roll out in June, uh, and several things in September of this year. And I'm going to go through a timeline, and then we'll talk more in detail about how these things will affect individual situations. Uh, June 21st, those with pre-existing conditions who have been uninsured for six months or more can buy coverage through a national temporary high-risk pool, okay? And I'll, like I said, I'll explain more later. Children, in September, children with pre-existing conditions cannot be denied coverage. Children up to age 26 will be eligible to stay on their parents' plan. That may affect musicians who tend to be a little bit uh, younger. Insurers can't cancel policies of people who get sick. That's known as rescission. Uh, there will be no lifetime caps on medical coverage and restricted annual caps. And there'll be a $250 rebate for those in the Medicare Part D donut hole. In 2011, there'll be 50% off drugs for those in the Medicare donut hole. And in 2014, all of the big stuff starts to happen. Uh, insurers can't refuse coverage to anyone with a pre-existing condition. This is actually already law in New York and New Jersey and a couple other states, but in 45 states it's not law. So in most of this country right now, you can be denied coverage for any reason. Insurers do not have to insure you. Starting in 2014, they can no longer do that. Most people will be mandated to buy coverage and there will be penalties if you don't. State-run exchanges will offer insurance to those who don't get it through an employer or a government program, and only those people will be eligible to buy insurance through, through these exchanges. So for people on government programs or for people who get their insurance through their employer, not a whole lot is going to change, okay? People with low to moderate incomes will be eligible for subsidies to pay for insurance through these exchanges. There will be sliding scale caps on annual out-of-pocket costs. That doesn't include the cost of premium, but it does include premiums, but it does include stuff like co-pays, deductibles, co-insurance, stuff like that. No one will be uninsured for the sole reason that they have a pre-existing condition. And people with low incomes, and that is considered for one person $14,403 a year or less, will be eligible for Medicaid, and low-income children will continue to be eligible for CHIP. CHIP is a program that insures children all across the country. The funding was in doubt at one point. This continues the funding of that program. Okay. All right, so first I'm going to talk about those people who are uninsured. That's what this reform is really trying to address. 
People who don't get their insurance through a government program or employer will be able to buy insurance through an exchange. This is really just simply a marketplace. And it's probably going to be online. And it's going to be an area where you can go and look at all the different plans that are out there. EHealthInsurance.com, which is a, a website, commercial website, already kind of does this. But this is going to include all insurers out there. And you're going to be able to buy uh, and by the way, we're on the second page of this handout for those of you who have it, sorry. Um, and it goes left, bottom, top, bottom, right, top, bottom. Um, uh, so, so you'll be able to buy insurance through this exchange. People with low to moderate incomes, in other words, for one person up to $43,320 a year, will re receive refundable and advanceable tax credits to buy insurance on the exchange. So you're going to be subsidized so that you can afford this insurance. Okay. If you've been uninsured for six months or more and have a pre-existing condition, you'll be able to buy coverage through a national high-risk pool. Again, this rolls out in June. For, so for those people who are uninsured now, have been uninsured for six months or more and have a pre-existing condition, they're going to be able to buy insurance, insurance through this national high-risk pool. That's very important for people to understand, okay? Um, this high-risk pool will cover at least 65% of costs. It's going to limit a person's out-of-pocket spending to roughly $6,000 a year. So you will not pay more than $6,000 a year in out-of-pocket costs. Again, co-pays, deductibles, co-insurance, stuff like that. Does not include premiums, though. And it will cover pre-existing conditions. Okay. This is good for people who don't have any insurance right now um, <clears throat> and might have a chronic condition that isn't being treated, but it's not good for someone who called me the other day, for example, who has lung cancer and whose insurance is running out uh, because he hit uh, uh, an annual cap. His insurance is running out, so he now has the choice of either being uninsured for six months, but that's not really viable because if you're uninsured for six months, you're accumulating all that medical debt and then going on the national high risk pool or trying to buy insurance on the open market, which in his state is not going to be possible because he has a pre existing condition or possibly getting on a government program that exists right now and he may be able to do that. So for, for some people, this high risk pool is going to be a great thing, but it's, it's not necessarily for, for everybody. Um, let's see, oh, sorry. Uh, in 2014, every American is going to be required to have health insurance and penalties will apply. Um, the penalties are going to be the greater of $695 per person or 2% of household income. Okay, so that's quite a bit of money. Um, oh, yeah, sorry, I skipped that. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, if you buy your own insurance right now, uh, in 2014, insurers must cover you regardless of your health status. They cannot drop you from coverage when you get sick. That will start next year. So in other words, if you have a health policy and all of a sudden you're diagnosed with cancer, they can't look back at your application and say, oh, you had a pimple in 1999. That could have been cancerous. We're going to drop you. They can't do that anymore, OK? And yes, that's a true story. Um, you will be able to shop among private insurance plans that will be sold on the exchange, again, very similar to those who are currently uninsured. There will be limits on how you will have to pay for premiums, how much you will have to pay for premiums, and your coverage will include an essential set of benefits. Okay? Um, the essential set of benefits includes hospitalization, emergency room services, maternity services, medications, mental and substance abuse services, rehab, preventive care, and outpatient care. So the essential benefits are, are pretty, uh, pretty comprehensive. Um, there will be four plans in the exchange, four main plans, different levels of coverage. 
a bronze, a silver, a gold, and a platinum. There's also going to be a catastrophic plan for people under the age of 30. Again, maybe something for musicians, younger musicians out there. That deductible is going to be roughly $6,000. So it's a high deductible, but it's going to be a cheaper plan than the others. Once you meet that deductible, most likely coverage is going to be at 100%. That's something that's rolling out in 2014. Um, all right. You may be eligible for a tax credit to pay for your coverage if you meet income guidelines. If you're under 400% of the federal poverty level, it, there's going to be a sliding scale. The government's going to kick in subsidies on that sliding scale. If you get your insurance through your employer or union, you're going to be least affected by this health care reform. You may see a reduction in premiums due to lower administrative costs, because they're going to try and streamline that, increased competition, and a larger pool of insured Americans. There will be no lifetime limits on coverage starting this year, and beginning in 2014, there will be no annual limits on coverage. Okay. Plan descriptions will be standardized so that you know what your benefits are and what's covered, so hopefully they'll be more consumer friendly. Again, adult children under age 26 can remain under their parents' coverage. Now, that's a really nice thing because the law stipulates that you can be up to age 26, you don't have to, one, live with your parents, you don't have to be a dependent on their tax return, you don't have to be a student, and you don't have to be single, so you can actually be married too. So this is a pretty in inclusive um, part of the law. If you own your, your own business, if you're a small business owner, there will be changes. Small businesses with less than 50 employees aren't required to offer insurance, but there will be tax credits if you do. You can get up to 35% of the premium costs and tax credits if you offer coverage. Employers with more than 50 employees will be uh, penalized if they don't offer coverage. Premiums will likely go down. And the reason for this is by allowing small businesses to buy coverage through an insurance exchange, they will get the benefit of pooling their employees with millions of others which will lower their financial risk and ultimately lower costs. What that means is that one sick employee in your small business is not going to increase the cost of your insurance overall, which it does now in some cases. And operating through an exchange will reduce administrative costs. Insurers will not be allowed to impose sudden arbitrary rate hikes based on the health status of employees. Employees at small businesses that don't offer coverage can get tax credits to buy it, and grants will be available to create wellness programs that reward employees. So that means that you might, for example, give your employees um, a discount on their premiums or uh, reimburse their co-pays or something like that. All right, there's probably not a whole lot of people in here that are on Medicare, but for those who are or who have clients who are or those musicians that are on Medicare, no benefits will be cut and many preventive services will be free. Free screenings will include uh, bo um, body mass index, bone density, PSAs, cardiovascular tests, colorectal exams, diabetes tests, and mammograms. Okay, That's a really good thing because right now some of those tests are, are um, dependent on a 20% coinsurance and paying the deductible. That will no longer be the case. And the Part D donut hole will gradually be eliminated so that drugs in the gap will be lowered to 50% of retail cost next year and 25% by 2020. People in the donut hole this year are going to receive a little check, $250 rebate. Income thresholds for Part B premiums will be frozen at 2010 rates. That's roughly, for most people, around 100 bucks a month. And a voluntary federal program will be created to provide long-term care insurance and cash benefits to people with severe disabilities. Now, this is something that's voluntary, but everybody that's an employee is going to automatically be enrolled come January 1st of next year. You're going to have to actually opt out of this program, okay? Um, what it does is it provides no less than $50 a day to buy non-medical supports and services. 
There's a five-year vesting period, so you're going to pay into this for five years. And then if at the end of those five years you are one of these people with severe disabilities, you can take advantage of this long-term care insurance program. Okay. All right, that's a general overview. I know I've already gone over time a little bit. Um, the Actors Fund, just so you know, um, is involved in this health care reform in, in various ways. We do workshops, we create guides and materials. We have a website, aherc.org, where we have a lot of information about health care coverage options all around the country. We will be updating that for all of this health care reform information. You can click on individual states and you'll get a whole bunch of information about what's available in your state. Um, and we also have, like I said, free health clinics um, where we see people in the entertainment industry for free. Uh, the biggest one is in New York City. And uh, we also recruit specialist volunteers to see our patients for free. Here are some resources for you guys. I think these are very dependable sites. Of course, uh, Alex is going to be talking. Um, and uh, he's the genius behind Hint. And um, <laughs> Families USA is another excellent website for information on health care reform. Healthreform.gov is the, gov is the uh, government website. And the Kaiser Family Foundation is kind of the last word in all of this. They're, they're wonderful. Adam will also be talking, and he's from Fractured Atlas, and they have a lot of information or are involved in advocacy in this, in this thing as well. So there's my information. If you want to give me a call or email me, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks. Thank Thank you, Renata. Wow, that was a wealth of information. Let me just move this down here. So, uh, after all that information and the, the, some of the, data, the survey results we got, I was wondering if Nancy Pelosi was right. Can artists quit their day jobs? I don't know. Not quite yet. Not, Not quite, quite yet? yet. <laughs> okay. Well, Adam, why don't you just give us a little bit about your, you and Fractured Atlas, just to give us a little start. Yeah, sure. So um, thanks for having me sure. first. Uh, I'm the executive director of Fractured Atlas. We're a, a national organization that um, we really kind of provide infrastructure for the cultural sector. We help individual artists of, of every stripe and also small arts organizations. Um, health insurance uh, has been kind of part of, of that, um, gosh, for a long time now, for about 10 years now. It was the first um, real major service that we, uh, that we provided, and we're, we're, we're still, uh, still slugging away at it. Um, our program, you know, primarily, uh, historically has focused on actually, in, you know, enrolling p people, artists, uh, in health insurance plans. Um, we do also you know, see ourselves as as um, as advocates and as and as people who are kind of um, you know trying to educate the field and, and advocate for its uh, needs, uh, and that's an I think an increasingly significant part of of what we're doing in that space. Um, as far as the insurance itself, uh, it varies based on where you live because health insurance historically has been um, regulated state by state, and the laws have been very different. Of course, that's all starting to change. Um, you know, being phased in um, over the next few years, as you just heard. Um, for now, uh, our plans in New York State are probably strongest, um, and that's, that's because that's where we've just got the largest concentration of members. We've got about 12,000 members nationwide. Oh, I don't know, maybe 5,000 uh, and change are in New York State. Um, so there we have a, you know, an association-based group plan. It's, um, it's, it's based on kind of high deductible uh, coverage uh, with a health savings account attached to it. Um, and that's really, in general, something we've sort of specialized in and really focused our, our efforts on because we feel like it's a, a really good fit um, for our, you know, our, our constituency. Um, outside of New York, mainly what we're doing uh, is sort of functioning as, a, as an advisor. We'll, we'll kind of help you get steered toward a plan that, that meets your specific needs. Um, and, and you know, we'll actually go as far as to en enroll you uh, in it if we can. 
um, and then sort of serve as an advocate throughout that process. If you have problems getting a claim paid or, or what have you, we, we can help both in terms of people on our, on our staff and also we have a, a relationship with some outside um, organizations who can help with that too. Uh, mainly that happens through a, a partnership with Aetna um, and that's in I think 30 or maybe 32 states now. Um, so there's New York, there's the 32 Aetna states, and then there's everywhere else where we are much less useful. Um, uh, but we're, we're sort of constantly um, working on it. And I'm, you know, I don't really honestly know uh, what's going to happen over the next few years in terms of how all this is going to affect what we do. Um, it's going to be interesting to see. I have some ideas, mm -hmm. but um, we'll see how it all unfolds. Alex, can you give us a little bit about you and Hint? Uh, Hint was started about five years ago to uh, primarily answer musicians' questions about what their options are. It's a, uh, it's a telephone based service. You can go to Future of Music, uh, Future of Music's website, and sign up for an appointment, and one of two of us will call you and kind of help you navigate through what your options are, which is what Hint stands for Health Insurance Navigation Tool. Um, sometimes the calls range from being something that borders on hopeless and we do the best we can, but a lot of times we find that um, by educating the person we're speaking with on the phone that um, they have more options than they, they thought they had. And that sort of alludes back to something Kristen said earlier, and that was that a, a lot of people who think they can't afford health insurance aren't aware of some of the things that are available to them. A fractured Atlas is oftentimes one of the things we direct people in the New York area to. And then there are other things like short-term plans, which are necess not necessarily the best solution, but it is a solution. And that's pretty much what we do, is we just try to do the best with we can with the information we're given by the person we're speaking to on the phone. Um, and as this legislation rolls out, I feel like Hint's role is going to be even more based on education because whereas in the past few years we've been basing our Hint advice on why people should get health insurance and how it will prevent them from suffering a whole uh, laundry list of, of pain, um, I think um, now that everybody's going to have to get it, our, our role is going to increasingly become more oriented towards um, what does all of this mean? Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, that's, that's where I, I see that we're going to now. So as Alex was just talking about, musicians in this, you know, in the, sort of up until March of this year were, had a, quite a few options. Um, sometimes they didn't know about all of them. Like, right. could you possibly incorporate as a small business, as a, as a band? you know, and potentially have access to a small group plan? Are there state-based resources? And AHARC's website I know you use all the time in order That's, to access. That is the world's greatest cheat sheet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, Usually what happens when we get somebody on the phone is we're like, hold on a minute. We get AHARC <laughs> up and say, oh, you're in Kansas? And then we sound like geniuses because we can just <laughs> recite what the rules are in Kansas thanks to you guys. So it, it just, uh, there's, there's more options than people uh, maybe know that they have, um, and you know we've spent probably a good amount of time trying to f you know m lay them out for people on websites and stuff like that. Uh, maybe for Adam to start, as the rules change, how do you see your relationship with your client base and your members changing? I mean, are, what kind of information are you um, sort of, what kind of counsel are you giving them right now? Uh, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think. Uh, Obviously, you know, the, the, I think on a very practical level, the fact that everybody's going to essentially be required to, to have insurance is going to be a, a big deal. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of uh, people in the arts are, um, you know, uh, well, uh, twice as many mm -hmm. uh, musicians, I guess, are uh, uninsured uh, as the general population. Um, so, you know, I, I do think, you know, as, as Alex said, it's going to be a lot of... Um, a lot more steering, a lot more, um, you know, it's less less about the question of can I afford afford insurance or, you know, should I get insurance and, and more about, all right, I got to have it. Um, what do I do? Uh, you know, what what's the best mm -hmm. plan for me? Um, and and I, I, I see that as a positive shift, um, frankly. Mm -hmm. Renata, when you, I know, I've, I've, when you put together um, your presentation, you must have sort of thought, 
um, of some of the sort of best uh, outcomes of this legislation. It's probably some of the challenges. Can you talk a bit about some of the things you see that are the best outcomes, especially for musicians, and maybe some of the things that might be difficult? Yeah, I mean, the best outcome, can you hear me? Yeah. The best okay. outcomes uh, will be for those people who are currently uninsured and can buy insurance then on the open market and don't have to worry about uh, you know, begging for coverage or being denied coverage. Um, some of the problems are going to be that it could be quite expensive for people. So um, what is what the government will consider affordable insurance will be up to 8% of your income. That's quite a bit of money. Even if you're not making a whole lot of money, it's still a nice chunk of money to be paying for health insurance. So, so that could end up being a problem for people. Um, you know, they will subsidize, the government will subsidize people up to, who are at up to 400% of the federal poverty level, so you'll be getting some, some money to help you out, but still, you know, it's, it's quite, a, quite a chunk of change. Do you see, this is almost probably too impossible to predict, but my brain thinks to the next step, which is, what is that going to look like? How are artists going to actually navigate these exchanges? What is it going to look like? We don't know. Yeah. Basically, we don't <laughs> know right now. Again, a lot of this stuff is being written. We're not even sure how this high-risk pool is actually going to be implemented because this is a national program that they're going to have to roll out by June. Of this year. Of this year, yeah. yeah. So in a few weeks, Next right? Week. In a few weeks. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. yeah, so, uh, and, and we haven't gotten any information. They were supposed, each state was supposed to submit uh, their proposals by the end of April. So, and there's no information really available right now as to how that's going to work. So that is, for us, the big question mark. We have to keep on top of this so that we know how these things are being implemented and where to go for information. Now, the current healthreform.gov website is good, but it's kind of propaganda, you know, I mean. And uh, the government is also going to be rolling out another website in July, apparently, that will be more specific once they get some of this stuff nailed down. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the th little th findings we had in our survey was something about, you know, membership and that uh, musicians who are members of particular organizations are, le more less, are more likely to be insured. Do you see any of the sort of uh, genre-based associations, music associations, performance rights organizations maybe having a new opportunity to provide a, a group plan to their members? Because I'm not sure it's been very easy up until now. I'm not sure if the, I mean, the laws aren't going to change in a way to where I don't, I don't think the PROs are going to be able to offer anything they haven't offered up to this point. I mean, am I wrong about that? Well, you? I think, um, you know, the, the big fear, of course, the, big, the main reason that insurance companies have historically um, really not liked working with associations has been the concern about adverse selection, right, which is if you're in a, an employer group, the employer's going to buy everybody coverage regardless, but the the assumption, and, and frankly, you know, evidence tends to bear this out, mm -hmm. is that when it's a voluntary association that, that you just sign up for or not, that people are, you know, going to make a rational decision based on are they anticipating spending, you know, having a lot of, of health care expenses. Mm -hmm. So the fact that there's now an individual mandate uh, and that, that, you know, people are kind of no longer have that um, ability to, to opt out of the system. My hope is that um, associations will be more attractive mm -hmm. uh, to insurance companies um, because of the sort of valuable role that we can play for them in terms of you know taking some of the customer service burden off their hands, things like that, streamlining enrollment. Uh, I think there's a lot of, of um, valuable roles that a, that a uh, sort of competent uh, intermediary can play. Right, and does, does, could Fractured Activists play that role as something between the association and the insurance agency? Well, we, we are an association yeah. now, so we, we do have, you know, a, a, an association-based um, group plan in, in New York State, um, and then a sort of quasi-association, um, uh, you know, relationship, although technically they're individual plans, uh, with that now outside of New York State. Um, but, you know, one of the things we're looking at uh, as part of the exchanges, and this is an area of the law that uh, there's, like, no detail on that I've seen anywhere, and hopefully it'll come out soon, but you know, there's this concept of navigators, um, which is this sort of uh, amorphous idea um, that, you know, states will be allowed to make um, grants essentially to organizations that serve as navigators for the exchanges um, that, that, you know, help advise people and steer people towards an appropriate plan for them. 
I don't think anybody knows yet what this is going to look like in practice. Um, my hope is that you know we might qualify, mm -hmm. and that that might be something that that we can do. I don't know to what extent the states are going to be open to um, you know working with a, a kind of industry specific navigator. Uh, as opposed to something, you know, somebody more more broadly defined. Right, although oh. a case could be made that, you know, even though you sort of represent musicians and creatives, creative folks, that there are structural issues that that make it difficult for artists to get health insurance under the current conditions, that most people act as sort of freelance, contracted-based work. Yeah, so, no, I think there's a lot of cases that could yeah. be made, um, you know, and I think it would be a a great idea, actually. It's mm -hmm. a question of, you know, whether we can persuade the powers that be, and, and to what extent you know, the navigator thing even becomes a reality because I don't think it's required. I think it's mm. a, a sort of an optional thing. Also, as the trend moves away from 50 different sets of rules in 50 different states, I think that'll, I think new opportunities will emerge for groups like PROs or large organizations to want to participate in a way I think it's, they've been timid about in the past. I mean, that's been one of yeah, the biggest absolutely. problems with Fractured Atlas, I think, is originally you, you, have had to contour what you do on a state-to-state -state basis, yeah. and it works really, really well for you in some states. And I would imagine in other states you just have to throw your hands in the air yep. and say, oh, I can't really do anything for these people. Yeah, no, that's, that, that's, absolutely, uh, that's absolutely true. Rana, what do you think about whether the group plans will be more available to associations and other? I, I have to agree with you. Yeah. I, it's just it's hard to say at this point. The hope is that they will. Yeah. Mm. Alex, do you see um, bands incorporating as, you know, a working band incorporating as a small business, is that still going to be a vi something you suggest to people if the conditions are right for them? Well, I mean, the, it, it, it all is based on conditions, mm -hmm. I think, and, and of course up to this point it's been a state-to-state -state thing. In some cases, in some states, it, um, the amount an insurance company can deviate on their rates basically gouge you <laughs> based on how sick you're your business is as a whole, uh, it, it varies wildly. I mean, the border from North Carolina to Virginia, for example, I, I'm from North Carolina, um, it goes from 50% to 300% that you can uprate a, a group that's not healthy. And, um, and so in certain states, we might recommend that bands look to incorporate because some of the members of the band are not healthy. Now, Legally, we can't tell people to incorporate solely for the purpose of getting benefits. They have to have another reason to become an LLC. But that could be maybe one of the reasons. Mm -hmm. Other bands are fortunate enough to need a tax break. I mean, we've, we've come across that a couple of times where they've been like, well, we, you know, can we effectively sing for our supper? Yes, you can. Mm -hmm. You know, you can buy health insurance as a group and then say that, you know, we and our band care about our employees because they're us. And so we want to give our employees this really sweet health plan. <laughs> and so, so I mean, I, again, I, I know the, the theme of the panel today seems to be, it remains to be seen. <laughs> but, um, I, you know, I, I'm not entirely sure what the future holds as far as that's concerned, but I'm sure there's going to be plenty of space for yeah. bands I to just, continue I, to consider incorporating. There was that point you made about the small group plans being able to pool with other small businesses. Um, you know how you said that in your presentation? Mm, what do you mean? Meaning that if you're uh, an employer with under 50 people, mm -hmm. that your small group plan could be pooled with other small group plans. Well, no, what I meant was that the pool is going to be bigger. Okay. Yeah, yeah, the pool of people is going to be bigger overall. So this isn't this isn't like the NZ bill that was being thrown around a few years ago where, right you know, they're, the association they're, of small groups. Where they're right. saying, yeah, I mean, everybody's getting told that, hey, you know, your small group can band together with other small groups and it'll be great. And you can, but, um, Let's forget about all the HIPAA laws and all those things that have protected you in the past few years. We're going to get rid of those too. Okay. Yeah, this is this is not that, thankfully. Yeah, that was going to be about the worst thing that ever happened to health <laughs> insurance reform. Just real quickly, along the lines of um, it remains to be seen. It, this also means that it's an opportunity for people to advocate for the changes that they still want to see happen. Believe me, insurance companies are advocating for themselves very, very strongly right now. They are up on Capitol Hill lobbying for every single loophole that they can find in these laws. So that means that it's still an excellent opportunity for you guys to, to make your voice heard and say, no, you know, we want to make sure that, that, you know, 
insurance companies don't include administrative costs, for example, in the uh, cost for required medical services. You know? Yeah, we're not becoming communists next week. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's one of the things that I think we've really had to fight against is that we, we did not get national health care. I mean, it, it, essentially, when we were faced with the problem of the fact that people didn't have health insurance, the solution was, well, make them buy health insurance. It's like telling hungry people they should get something to eat. But um, so, I mean, there's still a lot that you can do politically um, if you're inclined to ask for more. I mean, this should just be the opening of the door. Yeah. Right. Well, let's talk about who they should be talking to and what are the sort of the things that you mentioned one, mm -hmm. one thing we should not be charged for administrative fees. Mm -hmm. But what, what else should be, we'd be careful that it doesn't become a loophole just because people other people advocating for a particular outcome. Mm -hmm. I don't know, do you want to cover the advocacy piece? Uh, if I had specific thoughts, I would. <laughs> <laughs> I, need to think about, I need to think about it. Um, yeah. it's, uh, it's honestly, it's, we've, we've been in such a wait and see mode. Um, we haven't yet really uh, uh, formalized uh, an advocacy strategy on this. M you know, my hope is that, um, it's something there can you know the community can kind of band together mm -hmm. around and identify you know and I would love to see more collaboration, frankly, among organizations like Future of Music and uh, and Actors Fund and Fractured Atlas and and others, um, mm -hmm. you know, and sp kind of speaking with one one voice on this issue. Mm -hmm. I th I think one of the things that people need to start asking for is to make sure that this stuff is all massively simplified, because up to this point, one of the biggest problems. It seems like everybody has had. I mean, I'm a licensed insurance agent, and sometimes I look at plan details and I have to read them two or three times to understand them. And so when you start talking about, well, that's your deductible. Well, no, that's your out-of-pocket maximum, and you have to sort of add those things together to come up with what it's actually going to cost you this year if you get in a car wreck. But that doesn't really include your drugs. Those come out of another thing. I mean, we've got to stop that. That's I, I, I feel like there's built-in obfuscation in the system to kind of, I don't know, so the man can keep us all down. <laughs> I, I <don't> <laughs> and and if, we can, if we can get that stuff out of there and make this, there's no reason this stuff should be complicated. And the, if we're going to keep this system in place, I wish we wouldn't keep this system in place. I wish we would join the ranks of every other developed country in the world and just pass this thing over into the heavy lifting department along with rural electrification and the GI Bill. <laughs> but if we're not going to do that, if we've chosen to keep something resembling the system we've had in place up to this point, then I think the least we can do is say, can we please stop confusing people and just make it so they can look at half a page and know what they've got and know what it all means and the only people who will remain confused beyond that point will be the people who just don't care. That, that's a great point. And of course, the, the bill actually does, um, in theory, require that, mm -hmm. the, the exchanges. I mean, the, the, there are s supposed to be some sort of standardization of benefit descriptions and these sort of categorization into, you know, bronze, silver, gold, platinum, which I find a Slightly problematic, just Do because I'm not, it yet? I'm not sure that uh, <laughs> that's, that's, I'm not sure that, it, that that my gold is the same as your gold. Right, <laughs> but um, that's true. Uh, but I have but yeah, high standards. Right, 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 right. Yeah, no, and I'm 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 cheap when it comes to it. Right, so, I'm actually really cheap. <laughs> yeah, right. Give me um, the highest deductible you can get. No, uh, but I do think you know that that's again, it's one of these areas where there's this sort of very vague requirement in the law. Um, and it, it it's entirely depends on how the regulations are, are written and how it's enforced and and what the sort of fine print is that, that emerges out of the agencies um, that are responsible for enforcing it. So does the um, disputes about how it's enforced go to the state uh, insurance boards for, you know, is this how it will be regulated still at the state level? Some things will be regulated at the state level, for example, the exchanges, and some things won't. Some things will just be federal law. Um, mm. Yeah, no, I think that's right. Yeah. Exchanges, of course, are run with federal money, right. but as a grant to the state. It also brings up an interesting um, thing to watch, I guess, and, and that is how are states going to handle that authority? I mean, mm -hmm. like states that are full of people who think that this is some, you know, communist plot, 
how are they going to enforce it or not enforce it? And are they going to mm-hmm. protest it? And, mm-hmm. you know, is this going to become the new states' rights issue mm-hmm. or something like that? I'm wow, really, really curious point. about yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, that is going to be interesting. And, and uh, you know, a lot, of the, um, a lot of the timeline language also is, you know, X has to happen, you know, by 2014 or mm-hmm. by such and such date. I wonder if there are some states that may accelerate it. Mm-hmm. You know, some states that historically have had very strong consumer protections around health insurance. It's entirely possible. And and what happens if they don't? I mean, I'm actually kind of curious. I mean, we're three, four pretty nerdy people on this subject, and we still <laughs> don't know what's yourself. going to happen next week. You know what I mean? So what happens if people don't make the deadlines? It, it works both ways as far mm-hmm. as I'm concerned. Yeah. Some some are going to accelerate it, and I'm, I have a f- feeling that a fair amount of them are going to hold their breath. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely, yeah. All right. For those states, by the way, who have um, more generous guidelines, for example, in New Jersey, you can now be up to the age of 30 and still get insurance through your parents. Those those guidelines will stay in effect. So the federal guidelines aren't going to supersede the state guidelines. Mm-hmm. I, I, as as we sort of wander through some of these details, I'm thinking uh, as a music like trying to put my musician hat on and thinking like, wow, um, how would I possibly figure out what's what would change for me you know as a say i'm a a self-employed uh uninsured musician and trying to think like well how could i figure this out and we've talked a little bit about you know how we see say for example hints role changing Mm -hmm. um we of course we still need more information to be able to help people Mm -hmm. but are there other things that musicians should be doing right now sort of general interest things like the new york times has a pretty good widget about what to do in certain uh, scenarios about what you should be looking for, but what else are you t- relying on for information about how these plans will affect different groups? The, uh, we're relying on the information that we get from the resources that I posted, mm-hmm. and we're just going to keep putting that information out there in the form of workshops and guides online, and just in trying to distribute it the way the way we generally distribute things. Well, mm-hmm. Something Hin has been telling people for many many years is to sort of reverse engineer how people have thought about health plans, and that is. Drug copays, drug plans and copays are all great, but those are not the things that keep you out of the poorhouse. The things that keep you out of the poorhouse are, you know, what is what is the maximum amount you're going to pay in a year, in a really, really catastrophic year, which is your deductible plus your out-of-pocket maximum combined. And once you determine what that number needs to be, where you can af- afford to press on or the benefit concert, uh, bailout clause will work for you, <laughs> actually work for you, um, or your parents or best friends or whoever can help you get through that tough point, then everything else just sort of falls into place. And that's not going to change. Mm-hmm. It's still going to be based on what is, okay, worst year I can possibly imagine. Anvil falls on my head, you know, and I get hit by a car, all of it together. I have cancer. You know, what's the most I'm going to spend this year. And that would be called the dedu- your annual deductible? Well, no, that's annual your ca- deductible. Out of, annual out-of-pocket maximum. Yeah, you're, well, you're, well, you have your out-of-pocket maximum, mm-hmm. which is above the deductible. And those right. two things uh, combined, we would say your, your, your indemnity, or uh, there are a number of things that you can call it. But just find out the, the most amount you would have, the most and, you would have to pay. And what, what, kind, what, insurance poli- what do insurance policies usually have? Like what, you know, is that a million dollars? Oh, no, I'm kind of thinking in the opposite direction. Uh, uh, You're sorry. You're You're thinking, like, uh, what what can you beg, borrow, or steal? Yeah, Yeah, let's let's say that, yeah, Yeah. let's say that you have a $5,000 deductible, and then you enter into the co-insurance phase with the company where you're splitting it 70-30, 50-50, 80-20. You're paying some, and they're paying some. And as soon as you pay, say, another $3,500, you're off the hook. So you add your deductible plus that number. In our example here, that's $8,500. That means... For the most part, on a really, really terrible year, eighty-five hundred dollars is what you would need to spend out of pocket. Am I right so far? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. No. And 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 so so if you once you determine what that number is, and you pick the plan that has that number, and that's a number you can, I don't want to say afford because I don't think survive. a lot of people you can. can. You're, you're you could survive. Go and not only could you survive, but you could survive two, three, four years of chemotherapy, and you may have a hard time doing it. You might need to, you know, mortgage something or borrow from your friends or something, but you're not going to go down completely. Mm -hmm. Once you figure out what that number is, 
then whatever co-pays drug benefits you get, mm -hmm. anything that comes with that are secondary considerations. And that basic philosophy of how to pick a health insurance plan is not going to change as far as I can tell, even when all this wonderful legislation rolls out. I, I think that's a great point, and I'm glad you, you, you brought that up. I mean, yeah, $8,500, um, well, that would suck. Right? Yeah. But it's, it's... I don't have it in my wallet. But it's a, it's a lot. Right, yeah, no, uh, neither do I. But it's a, but it's a lot better than two hundred fifty thousand right? dollars. Sure, it's, it's sure. It's the right. difference between really unfortunate and painful and sort of life destroying. Right? Sure, and, sure. And, and and I think you know high deductible plans kind of get a bad uh, reputation historically. Um, you know, we think for, for I mean we've we've have really kind of backed them um, pretty strong. We, it's really what we sort of specialize in. Um, for better or worse. I know they don't work for everybody, mm -hmm. but for the majority of our folks, the majority of our members and our constituents, um, th th you know, they're actually going to save a lot of money by, well, by paying much less on, on the monthly premium. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so what happens is, I mean, assuming that like most youngish people who would be the primary demographic, I guess, that yeah. you're talking about, right? that you're, most years you're really not going to have high health costs. That changes as we get older. I have that to look forward to in the next few years. Um, if, if your expenses aren't very high, then what you're safeguarding against is the catastrophic loss because to pay hundreds and hundreds of extra dollars per month just so you can go to the doctor for 20 bucks, I didn't study economics, but that <laughs> doesn't really seem like a good deal to me. What you want to do is have something in place that takes care of the heavy lifting. And one interesting thing that musicians have going for them that I don't think accountants have going for them, for example, is accountants don't often hold benefit concerts for each other when one of theirs goes down. So last year, for example, I played a concert and, and one of the bands I'm in uh, raised about $1,100 for a friend of ours who is really, really sick. And a few other bands banded together and I think the last tally was about fifteen or $16,000 was raised for this guy. Now, he didn't have health insurance, so I'm kind of curious as to where the $16,000 went. Did it go to the creditors? I mean, if he had had something that we're talking about here, something that had a, we, we could call it a stop loss, even though I think in today's news terms, we don't like using the term stop loss so much anymore. But we could call it a stop loss to where that would, if he had had this $8,500 cap in place, that would have taken two years, you know, just a few benefit concerts. That would have taken care of two years of this guy's capped out expenses. It actually would have done something. But instead, because if he had, you know, $100,000. Oh, I think it's like five. Fine. So it's so five. Yeah, right. So it's yeah. five. So you, you took a little tiny chunk out of his debt. You made us, you know, the, that money that the creditors wouldn't have gotten anyway, frankly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and he's still probably going to go bankrupt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. So, so you, I mean, so you see, there's good deed, but yeah, yeah, exactly. It was, you know, it. it I guess it, it's nice. Uh, it's nice to not only show people that you love them, but actually give them money that can go towards something and sort of turn the insurance company into the, you know, the heavy lifting mechanism, mm -hmm. and then handle all the things below that on your own. You get a couple things out of this. You shift the burden to the insurance company. You give them less money per month and I think we're all pretty pleased about that and um, and uh, y you know when it's all said and done you have sort of stayed outside of the health insurance industry until you really really need them mm. and it sounds like the current health care legislation will actually make it a little bit easier to take the path that Alex suggests, you know, having a very, like a substantial backstop behind you, mm -hmm. which is because if they can't deny you for pre-existing conditions after a certain point, and potentially you can be added to other people's policies, mm -hmm. um, it sounds like that um, sort of, um, that advice might actually be a little bit easier to implement now? I don't, I, and that's not necessarily true. I mean, one of the things that we're really kind of, uh, for sort of parochial reasons, most interested in, in finding out is what some of these, you know, minimum coverage guidelines are really going to look mm. like in practice because it's, it's possible that the kind of high deductible plans that we sort of specialize in focus on, the sort of $5,000 annual deductible or $10,000 annual deductible, um, those might not make the cut. And then what does that mean? Well, it means, cut. it means that uh, they, might, they might not be considered um, to provide... A minimal requirement. Yeah, to, to meet yeah. the minimum coverage requirements and then 
you know, the, the benefits would have to be increased, and then the premium's going to go up, and then it's going to be less affordable um, for people. Uh, so it remains to be seen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I guess I should have called that the title. Of the yeah. panel. <laughs> <laughs> At least until yeah, until 2014, I think every panel will have that subtitle. <laughs> right. um, Adam, I had a question about your HSAs. Do HSAs change at all? Which is health savings accounts? Does it does the legislation affect the utility of them, or how they operate, or what they do? Not uh, not in any ways that I'm aware of. Um, you know, HSAs. You can only get an HSA if you're enrolled in a high deductible plan. Mm -hmm. So, of course, in the scenario in which high deductible plans um, become less uh, available, then you know that affects HSAs as well. But I don't know. It, if either of you I think know it'll be more that. expensive to take money out for non-medical purposes out okay. of an HSA. Right. So that's when you say non-medical, you mean like uh, holistic? You know, right now you can do dental and vitamins right, and things right, like right, that uh, right. with your tax-free money. That's going to change. I, I'm not exactly sure which ones will change. Mm -hmm. I don't know exactly how they're going to define it, but they're going to make it more expensive. Just, just to clarify, so I mean, we're making some assumptions that everybody knows what this means. With a health savings account based plan, you're allowed to put money aside tax free, and you can use that on things that are related to your health insurance plan and for things that traditionally have not been covered. So uh, that money, that tax free money, can be used for. Uh, acupuncture or um, uh, dental. Most plans don't carry a dental component, but you'd be able to go to the dentist tax-free. And that's, what, that's what we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, actually, I'm remembering, I don't think that over-the-counter medication is going to be covered through HSAs in the mm -hmm. future. So no. that, I think that's one of the things. Over-the-counter. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. hmm. I'm a big fan of HSAs. I mean, I, I, um, I personally, I've just switched my family to a, to mm -hmm. a high-deductible plan with an HSA. We, we kind of, I mean, I think it scared my wife, but um, we kind of ran the numbers on it and figured uh, kind of even in the worst case scenario in which we're maxing out our deductible, deductible you know, and out-of-pocket expenses every single year, we were still frankly going to come out ahead mm -hmm. than, than if we'd gone with the, uh, the plan we had been on before. And, and to put some things in context, up until I guess what, before the 1980s, most plans were kind of like HSAs without the the, the tax, tax benefit, right. yeah. like when the plan I grew up on, my my, my dad's a university professor. Uh, we didn't have copays, and back in the day, <laughs> we didn't have copays. Did you pay with the, the chicken? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> back, exactly. That's right. When I we paid with the chicken, and I walked up uphill both ways to the doctor. Um, yeah. So so the uh, I've always been really suspicious of the idea of uh, you know, when when copays and drug cards and things were added to these plans as a way to sort of charge people more money for their health insurance by giving them a perceived benefit which most people don't use and then of course when drug advertising started and everybody started self-diagnosing then they started <laughs> they started actually using the drug card and paying twenty dollars for drugs that cost two hundred bucks which goes back into the system and we pay for it anyway so by removing these things and going back to sort of pre-1980 what we would call a traditional indemnity plan i think that's that's a good trend right of course i mean it's funny people don't think of it this way but when you're buying insurance i mean you're you're buying coverage right and when you're buying a plan with more benefits lower copays etc you're buying more coverage therefore there's going to be more profits built in for the yeah. insurance companies i mean with any other business obviously it's in their interest there's to no get free you to lunch. buy more. Yeah, right? there's no free lunch. And the other thing that I bring up to people all the time is like, does your auto insurance policy change your oil and your tires? No. I mean, you should do that because if you don't, your car's going to break down and you're really going to hate it. I mean, that's, that's up to you to do that. And while I'm not saying that people shouldn't, um, it, that wellness shouldn't be encouraged, it absolutely should be encouraged, but f for that to have somehow be wrapped into the insurance policy in a way it doesn't exist in any other part of insurance dumb. Uh, <laughs> right. Well, although the I, kingdom of insurance. <laughs> my, my understanding, though, is that um, there are going to be some requirements for basic preventative, uh, basic preventive benefits, right? Yes. Um, yeah. uh, as, as going forward, and, and honestly, I, you know, that's not. I don't have a problem with that. I, I think it's it's good to encourage people to kind of do the basic routine right. stuff and and it's but kind of it's kind of depressing and unfortunate but the reality is is that people are more likely to do it if it's not going to cost them anything but i i'm more concerned about the 
about the, um, I don't know, kind of the stuff that goes right above that, the stuff that's sure. in between that and the catastrophic. So just scenario. give yeah. people, you know, an annual checkup. Yeah, I guess absolutely. That's the way I look at it. Just if yep. you really, really wanted to be benevolent or, or you really wanted to encourage wellness, you would just say, you wouldn't put a $40 obstacle between you and a physical, right, exactly. which if you're right. feeling good, you're not going to spend the 40 bucks. But if it's free, who doesn't like free? Well, it's not free. You're paying $300 a month for your insurance, but nevertheless. Right. Yeah. Right. Feels free. Um, so uh, we're going to go to some questions. We have about 10 minutes left. But first, I want to shout out to Aaron Moore from Columbus Musicians Co-op, who's here from Columbus, Ohio. Oh, who, hey, Aaron. Yay. Hey. So um, right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of... Uh, you know, paraphrase and know that Columbus Musicians Co-op has been trying to support musicians who have health care needs by organizing benefits and, yes, Chris, just a second, organize, why don't you say it? Um, we have grants to musicians that don't have health insurance right now and are really interested in how our program is going to change under reform and we just pretty much do anything to advocate for local music in Columbus, but the health focus is our main focus. So. Thanks. They are so good that I, I spent a lot of my time last week in the fancy pants and ultra organized community of San Francisco telling them how Ohio had them beat. Yeah. It looks like we have a question from Chris from the Twitter feed or the um, chat. We do. We have a question from the web. Um, someone asks, uh, they said many, spon many artists sponsored um, uh, plans require treatment in state, in the state of res residence, and they think that make, doesn't make very much sense for touring musicians. Um, can you guys comment on that? Uh, I believe you addressed, she also, there were, or he also had some questions about national catastrophic insurance, but I think you, you addressed that briefly. But. Thanks, Chris. Anybody else want to talk about in-state versus out-of-state um, care? Well, I mean, basically, they're probably talking about HMOs, which are local or regional, versus PPOs that let you go out of network that make a lot more sense for people who are traveling, any kind of performance artist that's on tour or anything like that. And I don't know at this point how that's going to be defined in, in health care reform. I, yeah, I don't think it gets, I don't think that changes. Yeah. I mean, most, even most HMOs, I mean, your uh, emergency coverage is almost always going to be national. It's not going to mm -hmm. matter where you are. Uh, yeah. for that. Um, but it is, it's for the sort of, for lack of a better term, sort of voluntary mm -hmm. coverage that, you know, where networks really matter. Right. You, you, most plans don't allow you to just go in for a physical because you have a day off in Oregon or something like that. You need to get home to do all those things. But I'm not aware of any plans, including HMOs, that won't allow you to get emergency coverage and at least get to the point where you are healthy enough to travel back into your home state. It's not ideal. Yeah. It's not ideal at all. I mean, I, I'm not saying I like the system. Once again, I'm a national health advocate. I think you should be able to walk into any hospital in America and get treated. Yeah. Yeah. But um, it, uh, the idea that people would be left high and dry because they got they broke their leg out of state, I, yeah. I'm not really familiar with that. Uh, yeah, I mean, breaking your leg is one thing. I mean, oftentimes, in our experience, people have to – they're heads have to be falling off basically for the insurance mm -hmm. company to pay for that emergency room procedure and generally what happens is they'll pay for the emergency room but they won't pay for you to be transferred into the hospital if you need follow-up care so mm -hmm. they, they might pay for that you know whatever goes on the emergency room but let's say the hospital decides you need to be there for a couple of days mm -hmm. those couple of days often aren't covered then so that becomes a problem and what we see among actors is someone for example in Toledo or wherever who has a horrible pain you know and might have an abscessed tooth or something like that doesn't want to go to the emergency room that's not a life-threatening illness what what do they do that becomes very difficult you know mm -hmm. to find care in that situation but whether that will change I guess remains, remains to yeah. be <laughs> I don't think so. any other questions yes right here. Yeah, um, uh, the mic microphone's coming to you yeah I was curious uh, during uh, Renata's slide presentation your uh, estimate of what's going to happen to premiums, were, were that, was that they're going to go down slightly because of the, I guess, uh, the simplification of the administration. Uh, the, the press, generally speaking, has been saying lately that they expect them to go up a little bit because of having to cover children uh, up to the age of 26. Is that, 
Is that like an over? Is it? Are they going to go up and then down, or is it anybody's guess? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is kind of anybody. I was just basing that on the fact that hopefully things will be streamlined, like they say they're going to be. That you will have a larger pool of people that you're working off of, and that the costs will be based on a healthy pool of people rather than just a sick pool. It's the opposite. Oh, I was going to say it's the opposite of what you were saying about adverse selection. Right now, people who are healthy sort of feel like they have a choice to or not to get health insurance, which keeps healthy people who are paying money into a system they're not really pulling a lot out of, out of the system. And so ideally, if everybody, including the healthy people who don't, you know, need, pardon the finger quotes, um, health insurance are paying into the pool, that could be beneficial to yeah. us. That's risk pooling, right? That's I mean, risk pooling, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think the, the insurance other, companies dream in a way. Yeah. I know. mean, my understanding is that um, a lot of that reporting really comes from one study that was um, you know, sponsored, financed by the uh, uh, insurance companies. Mm -hmm. And I think it was, you know, they were trying to sabotage the, the bill. Um, so they, you know, I, I, it may be legitimate, but. This is a pretty big handout to them in a lot of ways, I think. Because I don't, yeah, I, I, it's I, like, you, you know, they can, they can say that, that well, the, pre the pre-existing condition exclusion clause is gone. Well, there's no need for a pre-existing condition exclusion clause if people can't hop on and off of the rosters, right? So what they're getting is a bunch of healthy people who, are, who have to buy insurance and pay into a pool. And, I mean, you know, oh, no, the downside of it is they're going to get a few sick people on there, too. Yeah, some of the, some of the sort of smartest um, kind of industry insiders who I've, I have, you know, relationships with, um, some folks at Aetna, actually, uh, I had a conversation about this with them. They were... They were Quite fine with with this happening. Yeah. They, they, you know, they had some concerns about some some aspects like that. But on the whole, it's it's hard to argue with um, the government passing a law that says people have to buy your product. It's, <laughs> it's not unlike the law that was put in for in place in Massachusetts by Mitt Romney. Yeah, well, yeah, you know, it's, it's modeled after that. It's modeled, yeah, after, it's modeled after that. I mean, <laughs> and I don't think he's you know a flaming liberal or anything like that. Last I checked. So we have time for one more question, and then we're going to close it up. And there's a microphone for you. Hi, since it's the last one, I'll make it in two parts. First one is um, <laughs> you talked about they're not going to be able to deny coverage for pre-existing conditions anymore. Is there any kind of cost control? Can they not deny you coverage and charge you $10,000 a month or something? No, they cannot do that. They cannot change the rates based on your health status. Okay. They can, only, ch they can only take into account your age. Uh, they can't. They cannot take into account gender either. Women often pay more. Um, age, tobacco use, uh, family composition. I think that's it. Okay. And the, are, do you see maybe any progressive states like New York or California maybe trying to offer a public option? <coughs> no. <laughs> I, I know there was some. There's been some talk, but. I, I mean, I yeah, New York is a progressive state in that we don't just have Medicaid. We also have uh, Family Health Plus and Healthy New York, and those are programs that are much more generous than many other states have. So um, we cover more people than, than most states do. But a public option that would cover everybody in New York, just like a flat program, no, I don't see that happening. All right, well, it remains to be seen. I guess that's the, the yeah. catchphrase for today. So it, <laughs> yeah, we're going to shorten it to an acronym. So I'd like to thank, uh, join me in wel thanking our panelists for uh, such a great conversation. It's Alex Mayolo, Adam Hutler, Renata Mar Marano. Marinero. Marinero. <laughs> thank you.